climate crisis and bring down family energy bills by an average of $500 a year. We're gonna do this provided by providing working families rebates to buy new and efficient appliances, weatherize their homes, and tax credits for everything from heat pumps to rooftop solar to wind energy. It also provides tax credits to spur the construction of energy projects all across America. Projects that will deliver new clean energy and strengthen our country's grid. We also, it's good, they're also manufacturing tax credits as well in this, in this bill to make products like solar panels, wind turbines, battery storage, make it right here in the United States of America. This is going to create thousands of good paying jobs, apprenticeship opportunities, and manufacturing jobs for clean energy construction projects, solar projects, wind projects, clean hydrogen projects, carbon capture projects, and so much more. And along with the Chips and Science Act that I'll be signing the law next week, the Inflation Reduction Act will mean we're making the largest investment ever in clean energy and American energy security, the largest in our history. And it'll be the largest investment in American manufacturing in American manufacturing as well. Joining me today are the CEOs of some of the most iconic American manufacturing companies and the union leaders who represent America's manufacturing workers. They see, they see how already, because of our work over the last 18 months, American manufacturing is coming back stronger than ever. Where is it written that America can't be in manufacturing in the world? 613,000 manufacturing jobs created just since I took office. The most created in three decades. And with the investment in this bill, we are going to supercharge that recovery, make sure that the manufacturing innovation and jobs that come from this bill are made in America. And third, this bill is going to reduce the deficit by another $300 billion. That's beyond the record $1.7 trillion. We're on track to cut the deficit by just this year, this fiscal year. And we're going to help pay for those critical needs from working families in our economy by asking corporations earning more than a billion dollars a year to pay a minimum tax of 15%. That's less than a school teacher and an and a, uh, auto worker pay. Let me be clear. Despite what some folks are saying, the Inflation Reduction Act makes sure that no one earning less than $400,000 a year will pay a penny more in federal taxes, notwithstanding all these ads you see on television. But don't take my word for it. Nearly 130 economists, seven Nobel laureates in economics, Former, tr former Treasury Secretaries, the Federal Reserve Vice Chair, former Director of the Congressional Budget Office, wrote that this bill will, quote, fight inflation and lower costs for American families while setting the stage for a strong, stable, and broadly shared long-term economic growth, end of quote. So, you know, look at the facts. So let me close with this. The Inflation Reduction Act, lowers prescription drug prices, lowers health insurance premiums, invest in clean energy that will create jobs and economic opportunity for business and labor, reduces the deficit, and makes common sense reforms to our corporate tax code. These are the facts. One more thing, the Inflation Reduction Act has bipartisan support among the people of this country. Look at the polling data. The vast majority of people in America support what's in the Inflation Reduction Act. So my message to Congress is this, listen to the American people. This is the strongest bill you can pass to lower inflation, continue to cut the deficit, reduce healthcare costs, tackle the climate crisis, and promote America's energy security, all while reducing the burdens facing working class and middle class families. Pass it. Pass it, get it to my desk. Pass it for the American people. Pass it for businesses and workers. Pass it for America. I'm going to stop here and turn this over to Brian Dees to start the meeting. But thank you, and thank you all for participating in this meeting. I really appreciate it.
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and let me echo my thanks to all of you for uh, joining us uh, and for offering your perspective today. Uh, I just want to, uh, we'll start right in um, and uh, ask uh, Jennifer, you to, uh, to start us off. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the new role uh, and uh, would really appreciate your perspective um, uh, on the, from the manufacturing lens. Um, Cummins obviously iconic and long serving American manufacturing company. Uh, and, and I am told you can confirm if this is true that half of the diesel trucks on US highways today are powered by uh, Cummins, uh, Cummins engines. And so would really just love to start off with your perspective on um, how this legislation, um, as well as the other uh, efforts that we're working on together, affects your thinking about how to grow American manufacturing and, and importantly stay on the cutting edge of manufacturing innovation here. Great. Well, th thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to be here today and speak uh, in support of the Inflation Reduction Act and in particular the clean technology focus within that, that bill. As you know, Cummins is a global power leader. We're headquartered in Columbus, Indiana, and we employ more than 26,000 employees across the United States. In fact, we increased that number by several thousand yesterday when we completed our acquisition of Meritor. Uh, and we provide power solutions for a wide range of applications. As you said, Brian, we're best known for providing uh, diesel engines and trucks. And almost every truck on the road has either a Cummins engine or a Cummins component uh, on another engine. We also provide a, a wide range of other power solutions, including construction, agricultural equipment, uh, power generation, including backup power for hospitals, data centers, even the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and Mr. President, I thought you might be interested to know that we provide the locomotive engines for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor as well. We have a long history of ensuring that everything we do leads to a cleaner, healthier, safer environment. We've set an environmental sustainability uh, goals that by 2050, all of Cummins products, our operations and, and facilities will ha achieve carbon neutrality. And that's aligned with the P Paris Climate Agreement uh, and the United States own carbon reduction goals. And we truly believe that we can do things that are good for the environment and for our customers and our business. Decarbonization is critical. I read the news now almost every day that talks about record temperatures, fires in the West, flooding in Kentucky. Climate change is real and we have a responsibility to deal with it. And we have an opportunity to leverage that for growth in our business and for strengthening strengthening America innovation and competitiveness. To do that and to have the biggest impact and help our customers as we make this transition, create good pay in American jobs, we need the right policies and incentives for infrastructure development and deployment of new and improved technologies. And many of those market-based incentives that we think are needed are included in the Inflation Reduction Act. We think that the comprehensive scope of energy provisions from power generation to transportation to hydrogen production are all important pieces of the decarbonization puzzle. And they're important to ensure we have wells to wheels decarbonization and hard to abate, hard to abate sectors like those that we serve. The tax credits for low carbon fuel production, including renewable natural gas and renewable diesel fuel are needed. These alternative fuels can lower NOx and carbon emissions in many vehicles that are already in use. For new trucks, the 30% investment tax credit included for low and no carbon trucks and their respective charging and fueling infrastructure are critical to help fleets afford newer technologies like hybrid and battery and fuel cell powered vehicles as we continue to advance and scale up these technologies and make them more cost competitive and ensure our customers are successful in their businesses as well. The clean hydrogen production credit is essential to creating a robust domestic hydrogen economy so we so can compete with Europe and East Asia that are focused on doing that today. And finally, we think that tax incentives for fuel cells, energy storage, and microgrids will help accelerate more efficient solutions for stationary power. So we think these provisions make these new and low carbon technologies more affordable, accelerating infrastructure development and deployment, throughout the economy and by reducing some of the cost gap between traditional power and these newer solutions, we can advance their viable, viability and make them a reality. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here 
and to support the Inflation Reduction Act, which is good for the economy and the environment. Well, thank you. Is it all right if I ask you a question, Brian? <laughs> of course, Mr. President. Yeah, first of all, uh, you got me back and forth to, uh, to Wilmington, Delaware, to Washington, D.C. for a long time on Amtrak. Thank you. You're Look, welcome. Um, we're going to make a big investment in clean technology manufacturing facilities, like the facilities that make electric vehicles. How important will this investment be in building out the electric vehicle supply chains? Because it seems to me that's, that's one of the, I mean, everybody's looking at doing that. We seem to, I think we have enormous opportunity here. Yeah, I agree, Mr. Mr. President. There's a lot of work to build out those supply chains, to build out the infrastructure, um, to, to move to these new and a variety of different fuel and technology types. And we see a significant opportunity to increase U.S. manufacturing capacity and grow jobs here and all these different technologies that support our strategy, Destination Zero, to decarbonize our industry. So we're excited for the opportunity to, to bring some of those solutions here to the U.S., export those technologies globally, increase America's economic competitiveness as we, as we focus on this. And Cummins has done this before. We actually made diesel technology viable for commercial trucking applications. And we see the Inflation Reduction Act as one key piece of accelerating our journey and really transitioning our applications to technologies of the future like battery, fuel cell, electric, and green hydrogen. Well, I think you can do it. I really do. And I hope this is as helpful as we think it is, because uh, you've always been in the forefront here. And, uh, you know, uh, the idea, it, it just, we, I keep trying to remind people, and I don't think I have to remind anybody on this, uh, on this Zoom, that uh, there's not a damn thing we can't do when we set our mind to it. We have never failed in trying to break through, no matter what. I mean, over the last hundred years, and uh, I think this presents an enormous opportunity for a healthier environment, a cleaner environment, a cheaper environment for people to have to get by on. And uh, at any rate, I, uh, I'm, I, I am really optimistic. And uh, I want to thank you very much, Jennifer, for being willing to come and, and talk to us about it. Because we'll be My talking, pleasure. we'll be talking a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, I was going to ask, we'll go from uh, heavy-duty commercial to uh, uh, light-duty vehicles. And, Mary, uh, 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 thank you uh, for being here uh, and, uh, and just wanted to get your perspective on, you know, broadly the automotive sector and the, and the manufacturing uh, opportunity that you see here uh, and how this bill and, and the other things we're working on uh, will, will, will affect your perspective on where we can take the, the sector uh, in this country. Ma'am, you... Great. Well, uh, Brian, thank you. And Mr. President, uh, thank you as well. I today am at one of hey, our Mary, manufacturing by the way, facilities. We owe you big. You started all this. I remember <laughs> our conversation. No, I'm serious. I am serious. Yeah, well, well, we're working hard. And I'm actually at one of our manufacturing facilities in Ohio today. And I'm very pleased to participate on behalf of GM and to have the opportunity to add GM's voice in support of the Inflation Reduction Act as currently proposed. And Mr. President, I also want to thank you for your leadership, your engagement with congressional leaders and a broad set of stakeholders over the last year, I believe has really helped us get to this point. At GM, we believe we are at an inflection point and one that as we take these steps, we can create a much brighter future for America. You know, as we talked about um, the transition to an all electric future, Mr. President, you saw what General Motors saw and continues to see. And it's the opportunity to create and maintain good paying American jobs and the opportunity for America to lead in electrification and innovation. General Motors is committed. We've already announced historic investments in the United States. This bill will help drive further investments in American manufacturing and sustainable, scalable, and secure supply chains. And all that, co all that comes with that is a stronger economy and job growth. So we deeply appreciate also the inclusion of the EV provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. 
While some of the goals cannot be achieved overnight, we are confident that the significant investments GM is making in manufacturing, in the workforce, in our infrastructure, in supply chains, and in clean energy will establish the U.S. as a global leader today and in the future. So once again, thank you for the opportunity to voice our support for the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act. Thank you, Mary. Uh, uh, and I wanted to uh, just bring Liz, you in, you in here too. Uh, you said recently that this bill was, um, your, set, your focus here was on real solutions for working families and hoping you could give us your perspective from the kind of the, the ground level view uh, from the, the families and workers that you're talking to and engaging with, uh, how you see this piece of legislation intersecting with uh, their needs and, uh, and their priorities. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, too, want to start by thanking President Biden and the administration for, for your commitment to American manufacturing um, and, of course, for inviting us uh, to be a part of this conversation today. Um, I think it's a great mix of labor and business leaders, and, and it shows how important and historic the Inflation Reduction Act is. And I'm bringing the voice of our 57 unions uh, 12 and a half million members who believe this bill is going to help us reshape the future and deliver real help to working families by reducing rising energy and health care costs. And when I'm on the road talking to working people, they're worried about making ends meet. And so these steps to lower health care costs, um, you know, especially the high cost of prescription drugs, um, investing in our clean energy future, addressing our broken tax code. This is going to deliver fundamental economic change across America. And by the way, asking the top 150 or so companies to start paying their fair share of taxes is music to our ears. And let's just be clear, asking 150 of the largest, most profitable companies to pay a minimum of 15% in taxes is not going to harm manufacturing investment in the US. In fact, much of the revenue created by this tax would be from companies who have historically dodged taxes by manufacturing overseas. Um, so our members are especially excited about the historic clean energy investment that this bill would make uh, because, as was said, it's going to create millions of good jobs for working people and cut climate pollution by 40 percent. So this is what we need to jumpstart the clean energy transition, uh, address the climate crisis, make clean energy more accessible and affordable. And these investments would actually um, decrease the cost of domestic clean energy by over one third. And so that's gonna be a game changer for consumers. Um, but we have to look at the other side of the coin too. And, and this bill does that by keeping the working people who are gonna make that future possible front and center. And not only will it direct investments to underserved communities, it will also make sure that high working standards and high environmental standards can go hand in hand. And it shows that it's not a choice. We can do both. Um, and so including the uh, labor standards, domestic content requirements on the tax incentives, that's going to create good paying jobs in construction, manufacturing right here in America. Of course, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship provisions will make sure that these investments uh, not only help strengthen the environment, but are, are strengthening our economy and that pathway to the middle class. And so that's how we create lasting change that, the, that working families need. Um, so I just say this is a, we see this bill as a major step forward. Uh, it's gonna improve the lives of working people. It's gonna improve um, lives for seniors who are trying to pay for their prescriptions, kids who are gonna have a healthier planet to live on. Uh, so we are united in support for this legislation. We urge Congress to move it quickly, get it passed and signed into law, get it to the president to sign. Thank you. Hey, uh, Liz, thanks. Uh, and, uh, and Mary, uh, 
You guys are a hell of a team, what's going on. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, and you've heard me say this before, uh, my dad used to have an expression, he said, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's being able to look your kid in the eye and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. The only way we're going to be able to do that for American workers is make sure that we continue to grow and create good paying jobs. And that's what you're doing. And that's what the AFL-CIO is doing with Liz, making sure that we can talk about the impact this relief is going to have on American workers. In addition to, and by the way, I'm looking at a card here, reminding myself that it's going to cut energy costs, unlock $500 on average annually for energy savings, 30% tax credit for home energy systems like rooftop and solar and efficient windows, $7,500 tax credit for new electric vehicles and $4,000 tax credit for used ones, $14,000 for consumer rebate for high efficiency appliances like electric heat pumps. It's going to do an awful lot beyond what is the, the overall piece here about lowering inflation. And, uh, you know, in addition to the new jobs it's going to create in this bill, the Inflation Reduction Act is also going to bring down energy and health care costs for all Americans. And it's going to impact on, uh, on, uh, on this relief we'll have on American workers is real. Uh, Liz, do your folks talk about that? Do we talk about how it's going to actually, uh, you know, reduce health care costs, prescription drug costs, et cetera? Absolutely, Mr. President. I would say that that is what's most on people's mind is, um, you know, can they afford to pay their health care premiums? Can they afford to put food on the table for their families? And so bringing down costs for workers is exactly what we need in this moment, and that's what this bill does. And so uh, I know Ray Curry's on here with me. Um, that's exactly what we're trying to do is get the message out there, because as you know, there's often a disconnect in what happens in Washington to what happens at the grassroots and community level. Uh, so that's our job as, you know, leaders in the labor movement and, and working with uh, our members and working people every single day to, to make sure people recognize uh, what this bill is going to do and uh, so that they see the impact in their in their communities and in their wallets. And Mary, what General Motors is doing, I find uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, your commitment to uh, moving toward, uh, toward clean energy, commitment to, to electric vehicles, about being able to meet the 2050 international standard, et cetera. You're going to do it before then. And I, I just think that uh, General Motors is a, can play a gigantic role and, and other companies around the world are going to follow because you're going to be leading the world. One of the things that uh, I, I did, I must admit, in total disclosure, I've, I've spoken to the chairwoman about the possibility of my being able to buy one of those Corvettes that are electric vehicles that, uh, you know, when they come out. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to do it because I can't drive a vehicle while I'm vice president, while I'm president any more than I can when I was vice president. But I think we can change the face of the country with this legislation and reduce inflation, not increase it. Mary, do you have any closing comment you wanna make? Just that Mr. President, um, I completely agree with you. I, am, I couldn't be more excited about the EV portfolio that General Motors is in the midst of launching. Our first battery plant is coming online in a matter of weeks in Ohio. We have another plant in, next year and the following year, both in the U.S., and we're about ready to announce our fourth, as well as converting plants and making sure that we um, maintain and grow um, the jobs that we have uh, in this country. So, uh, you know, it is happening. We're at this critical juncture right now. And I think this uh, Inflation Redu uh, Reduction Act will be uh, part of the catalyst that helps us move forward. So thank you. Well, you guys are doing a heck of a job. I really mean it. Uh, thank you very, very much. I know there's more people want to speak and we're going to hear more, but uh, I just can't tell you how much I think you have collectively moved this whole movement of getting to clean energy, creating jobs, jobs are increasing environmental protection, reducing everything from drug prices on, matters. This is one of those inflection points in history. And uh, you all are at the, at the forefront of all of you on the screen. We haven't gotten even to most of you yet. But again, thank you both very, very much. Appreciate it.
And Mr. President, um, on the topic of, uh, of drug prices and health care prices as well, I, I wanted to uh, bring uh, Greg uh, Adams in. Uh, and you're serving uh, actively now, I think, 12 million uh, patients uh, and, and, and close to 2 million Medicare beneficiaries. And so would love your perspective on the, the health care elements of this, particularly in light of what both the president and Liz Schuler said about it being top of mind to people, health care premiums, drug pricing, and, uh, what, <coughs> and uh, your perspective. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Mr. President. I join my colleagues in saying it's a pleasure to be here today to have the opportunity to discuss the importance and the urgency of the, inf the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we see this important piece of legislation as being critical to helping millions of Americans continue to have access to affordable health care coverage. And it begins to curb the unsustainable drug prices and of course, as you've heard, it addresses climate change. At the heart of Kaiser Permanente's mission is a belief that all people deserve access to high quality, affordable health care. Millions of Americans will benefit from the extension of the expanded Affordable Care Act subsidies through 2025, which will continue to make health care and coverage more available and affordable for our people. Since the enactment of the, of the expanded subsidies, marketplace enrollment has reached an all-time high of 14.5 million people nationwide. And premiums became more affordable, or as premiums became more affordable, millions of Americans saw increased access to zero-dollar plans and low-cost plans with premiums of less than $50 per month. These expanded subsidies were set to expire so this legislation is just in time for millions of Americans. At Kaiser Permanente, we're deeply concerned about the burden high drug prices impose on our members, on whose behalf we buy over $10 billion of drugs every year, and we prescribe more than 90 million prescriptions annually. So while we believe it's essential to ensure that drug manufacturers are rewarded appropriately for providing real innovation, it has to be done at a, in a sustainable manner and not just allowing the highest possible price. The target approach here achieves an appropriate balance of those concerns. And the Medicare Part D changes protect seniors from the risk of very high drug costs and ensures that more seniors have the ability to access and are actually taking the drugs prescribed. Finally, I too note that the, the tremendous impact on climate change, climate change is real, it's here, and it is an issue for us as healthcare providers as it disproportionately affects socially disadvantaged communities. So as one of the nation's largest not-for-profit health plans and care delivery systems, each of these issues have a direct impact on our members, our patients, and our communities and are critical to our ability to carry out our mission to provide high quality, affordable care, and to ensure that we're helping improve the health of the communities that we, with which we're in and we serve. So we join our colleagues in encouraging Congress to act without delay to bring the benefits of this important legislation to the American people. Thank you, Mr. President. Brian, are you gonna, yes. I've got a question. Unless you, why don't you go ahead first? Well, Mr. President, I was going to um, I, I was going to just uh, turn briefly uh, before we get our other speakers to just ask uh, Secretary Yellen to offer. Um, uh, before you do, can I ask a question? Sure, of course. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, uh, first of all, um, Craig, thank you very much. Uh, you, uh, it's astounding the number of people you service every day. And uh, one of the goals of this bill is to keep drug prices uh, and, and while still allowing drug manufacturers to uh, be rewarded appropriately and for providing real innovation. Do you think, it, do you think this uh, um, meets that balance of both? I, because look, the last thing I want to do is I, I don't want to see there be a disincentive by drug companies to not seek answers 
to some of the diseases they're trying to deal with. Um, and uh, so they have to be compensated, but they're being incredibly well compensated now. And, uh, and from my perspective, I don't think that this upsets the balance of making significant profit at the same time providing breakthroughs and in innovation. What's your sense of it? Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I do. I think it does maintain the balance. The bill looks at the high cost of specialty drugs. Um, specialty drugs are a key component of the, the high drug costs. They, they actually account for a small percentage of prescriptions, but they are now at a point where they make up over half of our pharmacy costs, impacting the whole population. So the bill looks at a limited number of specialty drugs, um, actually um, calls for negotiation of prices at a point after these drugs have been on the market. I, as the CEO of Kaiser Permanente, will still be responsible and committed to using market forces to help keep the majority of other drugs affordable and accessible. So I don't see this as interfering. I think it carefully um, frames the balance that's needed. Um, so I, I think the answer to your question is, is yes. I, I think the balance is here, and I think there's plenty of room for innovation and for market forces to be at play. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian, back to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and uh, before we uh, get to Ray and David and Warner, I just wanted to ask Secretary Yellen to uh, just zoom out for a minute and give us your, your take of the overall uh, economics, particularly at the moment uh, we find ourselves in the, in the recovery. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Mr. President. I'm really excited to be here today to talk with leaders from both business and labor about how important it is for Congress to pass the Inflation Reduction Act. Actually, I convened business leaders myself yesterday to discuss this important legislation. It will address the cost of prescription drugs and health care for millions of Americans, lower energy costs, bolster our energy security, so we don't have to rely on autocrats like Putin. This would be the biggest investment in fighting climate change in our country's history. And this isn't just going to protect us from global energy shocks like we've seen from Russia's illegal invasion. It's also going to create good paying jobs across our country to power that work. I also think it's important to talk about the revenue streams that make these investments possible. And that means adequately funding the Internal Revenue Service so they can enforce our existing tax laws. The vast majority of businesses and workers are, play, are playing by the rules, but some aren't. And estimates show that the tax gap from the top 1% of earners alone is as much as $160 billion each year making sure we have the resources to ensure the wealthiest among us can't avoid paying the taxes they owe. That's about restoring basic fairness and ending a two-tiered system. It's about making sure we can invest in addressing those key household expenses and making our economy stronger. I think it's important to underscore that this legislation is fiscally responsible. It will actually reduce the deficit by hundreds of billions of dollars over time. And by reducing deficits, we'll be complementing the work the Federal Reserve and the administration is doing to combat inflation, even as we address these cost pressures like health care, prescription drugs, and energy. So that's why I hope Congress will pass this bill as soon as possible. And it's why you saw five of my predecessors at the Treasury Department, secretaries who served under Democrats and under Republicans, call for the same this week. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. And Mr. President, we're going to um, conclude the open press portion of this event uh, and, uh, and shift into uh, the, uh, the next section here. Uh, and, and in doing that, I wanted to uh, ask Ray uh, to come in. And Ray, it's great to see you.
Thank <laughs> you.